Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya August 24, 2013, Hilo, Hawaii, class over Skype. We're reading from Bhagavad Gita, text 8 through 12. We're going to be looking at the direct and the indirect path in detail and how they relate to each other. So first I'm just going to read through the translations of 8 through 12. Text 8. Just fix your mind upon me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and engage all your intelligence in me. Thus you will live in me always, without a doubt. Text 9. My dear Arjuna, O winner of wealth, if you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, then follow the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. In this way, develop a desire to attain me. Text 10. If you cannot practice the regulations of bhakti yoga, then just try to work for me, because by working for me, you will come to the perfect stage. Text 11. If, however, you are unable to work in this consciousness of me, then try to act giving up all results of your work and try to be self-situated. Text 12. If you cannot take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation. And better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. For by such renunciation one can attain peace of mind. So I hope you can all see the slides that we're going through. So here we're going to look at the relationship between the two paths. Again, the goal is spiritual loving service for Shaima Sundar. So that was established in the beginning of the chapter. Now the principle of these verses is that there are acceptable processes, good processes, better processes, and best processes to achieve the goal. So you can think of if you're going to travel from one point to another, you know, what's the best process? Do you take a plane? Do you take a car? Do you take a bicycle? Do you take a boat? What's the best way to get there? Of course, what's best depends on who you are. So when we say what is the best process, it's what's best for me and what's best for me now. So if you have an old junky car, you don't have enough gas or petrol for your car, then a bicycle might be the best path for you now. And the principle is that it's better to achieve success at a lower level than to fail at a higher level. So when I was running a school, I often had students who demanded to be put at a higher level than they were able to function. And that wasn't going to be good for them. What was better is that they proceed step by step from where they are. Of course, the opposite is also true, that if you're qualified for a higher level, it's best to be able to be at the level at which you can function well. So when we talk about, but we should keep in mind that when we're talking about what is the best, we're talking about not just in some theoretical, abstract way, what's the best, but what's the best for me? And what's the best for me now? Because what's the best for me is going to hopefully (laughs) change as we engage in the practice. So as we go through these verses, we should be able to figure out, where am I? Where am I on this path? Am I on the direct path? Hopefully everyone listening is on the direct path. Did I make a mistake and get on the indirect path? We talked about that in the first session, and we're going to get into more detail today. If I'm on the indirect path, how do I jump over to the direct path? If I'm on the direct path, where am I? And what would be my next step to progress? And am I in the right place on the, in, on the direct path? Am I at a place that's too low or too high for me? So what is the best process? This is text 8. The best process. What is it? 
Krishna says to have a fixed mind and intelligence on Krishna. Aratva, to fix. In, in other words, it doesn't waver. One is constantly thinking of Krishna. So here, Vishnu Chakravati Chakra. Gore, for those of you who weren't here for the first session, this presentation is based on Srila Prabhupada's purports to this part of the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada's purports elsewhere, particularly his purport to text 20 of this chapter, and the commentary of Vishnu Chakravati Chakur and Baladeva Jibhushan, and a little bit the commentary from Anujitarya. So here Vishnu Chakravati Chakur expands our understanding of this best process as given in text 8. He says, concentrate your mind on Krishna only. Remember only Krishna. My eva mana adatsva. Adatsva again is to be fixed. That form of Shama Sundar with yellow cloth and forest garland and not the impersonal Brahman. And here we see this statement relates back to Arjuna's question in text 1. What's better, the direct or the indirect path? And also fix your intelligence which has the power of discrimination upon Krishna. This means to continually reflect on the statements of scripture using intelligence, which will result in meditation. Such contemplation is called manana. Thus you will attain residence near Krishna. So this, we should really emphasize that this is a description of a process and not a goal. The goal is divine loving service for Shama Sundar, but this is a description of the best process to reach that goal. And the best way of reaching that goal is to have both one's mind and one's intelligence totally fixed all of the time without any deviation upon Krishna. One's mind meditating on Krishna's form, name, form, qualities, and pastimes and one's intelligence reflecting on the statements of scripture which then bring one to the goal which is the goal is that one is absorbed in Krishna and one will have one's residence near Krishna one will actually live in Krishna now what's the qualification how do you know if you can have your mind and intelligence 100 percent 24 hours a day fixed on Krishna, and Srila Prabhupada describes this in this purport, he said, the symptoms that indicate whether or not one's qualified is that when you're chanting Hare Krishna, you're experiencing that Krishna and his internal energy are dancing on your tongue. That you're experiencing that when you offer food to Krishna, Krishna is directly eating that food, and you're not living on the material platform. You're experiencing that you're living not in the material world, but in the spiritual world. Prabhupada would often describe his own life like that. That he'd say, I'm not really in New York, I'm really in Vrindavan. Wherever I go, there is Goloka Vrindavan. You know, he'd be asked, have you ever seen Krishna? And he'd say, yes, I'm seeing Krishna at every moment. So this is the qualification or text 8 process. And what's another name for this process? Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his commentary on text 8, said that this process is called Raganuga Bhakti. And this uh, Raganuga Bhakti, this is, we should really emphasize that Raganuga Bhakti is a process. It is a sadhana. The goal of Raganuga Bhakti is called Ragatmaka Bhakti or living with Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan. But it, there's, it is a process. It's not that sadhana bhakti uh, is only vaidhi. Sadhana bhakti is divided into two categories, vaidhi sadhana and raganuga sadhana. So this is a process. So one may say, well, I'm not qualified for this process. I don't have these qualifications that Srila Prabhupada mentioned. I can't have my mind and intelligence totally fixed on Krishna 24 hours a day. All right, then what's the best process for me if I'm not qualified for Raganuga Sadhana? So then we go on to text 9. In text 9, Krishna says, the best process for one not qualified for Raganuga Sadhana is Vaidhi Sadhana. 
which here Krishna is calling Abhyas Yoga. Abhyas literally means practice. Abhyas literally means practice. And yoga, of course, we know means connection. And here we're talking about bhakti, the yoga of connecting in love and devotion. So how do you practice love? <laughs> how do you practice love? In Raganuga sadhana, as described in text 8, there's already some love present. The total absorption of the mind and intelligence, let me go back for a minute, this total absorption of the mind and intelligence in Krishna is the result of some raga. It means that there's already some attachment. It's, this is not a mechanical samadhi, which we'll discuss later. This is the natural samadhi that occurs when there's love and attachment. And Srila Prabhupada, in his lecture on Bhagavad Gita 7.1 in Sanan, India, so beautifully describes this, where he says that everyone knows what it means to be attached. Nobody has to be taught how to be attached. And when we're attached to someone or something, when we're attached to some idea, when we're attached to some activity, we naturally become absorbed in it. There's no... Uh, although it's a practice, it's a spontaneous practice. Therefore, Raganuga Bhakti, Raganuga Sadhana is called spontaneous. If I love somebody, I naturally think of them. If I'm attached to going to the beach, you know, and then I'll be naturally and spontaneously absorbed in my plans. And this is true whether it's something I want or whether it's something I don't want. So this abhyasa yoga, there's not this attachment yet. There's not this raga yet. Uh, there's some. Uh, of course there's some. There's some raga and the shakti even in the very beginning of, of bhakti yoga, or one wouldn't perform bhakti yoga, but it's not very intense. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I want Krishna, but, you know, I, I really want so many other things. I want to become rich, or I want to climb Mount Everest, or I, you know, want the latest designer shoes, or I want a loving husband or wife, or whatever. You know, there's, our main attachment is to something else. Our, our raga for Krishna is very slight. So therefore, abhyas yoga, on this stage, abhyas yoga, means you're practicing love. So Krishna is calling it abhyas, practice. And Krishna explains this very wonderfully in the sixth chapter. From wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. So this is a brief description of what is a Bhyas Yoga. What is a Bhyas Yoga? That one is practicing. One's mind isn't naturally flowing to Krishna. One practices. Okay, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Right? And Vishnu Chakravati Thakur explains this even more. Where he makes the point that the word Abhyasa, a meaning practice, literally means repetition. And if we think about what does it mean to practice something? You're going to practice playing the piano. You're going to practice riding a bike. So my I have two grandchildren here who are learning to ride a bicycle. And one of them who's four has what's called a balance bike. They didn't have those when I was a kid. <laughs> it's a bike without pedals. Instead of using a bike with pedals and training wheels, use a bike without pedals and you using your feet to propel yourself. But what you're doing is you're practicing balancing. And how is she practicing? Well, she's doing it over and over and over and over again. Day after day after day after day. And her older brother, who's six, when he wanted to learn how to ride a bike with pedals, what did he do? He went with his father to a parking lot, and they practiced. Or my oldest grandson, who's 16, you know, and he wants to know how to drive. So how is he going to do that? He's going to get in a car, and again, and again, and again, he's going to practice. So this essence of a Bhyas Yoga means you're practicing over and over. And what are you practicing? You're practicing fixing your mind. Your mind is withdrawing. Oh, Krishna. Mind is withdrawing. Krishna. Mind is withdrawing. Krishna. Mind is going. Krishna. 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 Okay, let me bring it back. Krishna. Let me pull it back. Let me withdraw it from its other subject matter and bring back 
to Krishna. Mind, of course, and intelligence. And Srila Prabhupada, in his purport to 1710 in the, Bhag- in the Bhagavatam, says that this practice is transcendental. He says, practice of devotional service in the material field is of 81 different qualities, and above such activities is the transcendental practice of devotional service, which is one, and it's called sadhana bhakti. So once one is engaged in sadhana bhakti, again, which is the same as abhyas yoga, if one is engaged in endeavoring to withdraw the mind from material subject matter and place it upon Krishna by determination, that is on the transcendental platform. That is no longer in the modes of material nature. And we can see here in Nectar Devotion Chapter 2, the first stages of devotion, how Srila Prabhupada defines sadhana bhakti. He says, it is the duty of the acharya, the spiritual master, to find the ways and means for his disciple to fix his mind on Krishna. That is the beginning of sadhana bhakti. I want to emphasize Prabhupada is saying, that is the beginning of sadhana bhakti. What we call sadhana bhakti, here we're talking about vaiti sadhana bhakti, is to find ways and means to fix your mind on Krishna. This is an internal process. It's an internal process of withdrawing the mind and fixing the mind on Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada again is defining this process. He says, love of God is now in a dormant state in everyone's heart. The heart has to be purified of material association and that dormant natural, natural love for Krishna has to be revived. That is the whole process. So this is the definition of sadhana bhakti in a nutshell. That we're fixing our mind on Krishna. We're practicing fixing our mind on Krishna. We're practicing over and over again, taking our mind from other subjects and putting it on Krishna to revive that dormant love. When when we revive that dormant love, even a little bit, then that's raga. And then the mind naturally is flowing to Krishna. And that's the whole process. Now, how does one do a Bhyas Yoga? So Srila Prabhupada here is talking about what one does with the externals. He says, under the guidance of an expert spiritual master. Of course, we noticed that in the previous slides, uh, that there must be the guidance of an expert spiritual master. And in fact, Rupa Goswami, when defining bhakti, says there's the three most important things to take shelter of a spiritual master, to take initiation from a spiritual master, and to follow the instructions of a spiritual master. Without a spiritual master, one cannot engage in sadhana bhakti at all. So, going back here, Prabhupada says, under the guidance of an expert spiritual master, follow certain principles. One should rise early in the morning, take bath, enter the temple, and offer prayers and chant Hare Krishna. Then collect flowers to offer to the deity, cook foodstuffs to offer to the deity, take prasadam, and so on. There are various rules and regulations which one should follow. And one should constantly hear Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam from pure devotees. So here Srila Prabhupada is talking about the external practices of sadhana bhakti, which enable us, or greatly help us, shall we say, to practice fixing our mind on Krishna. And as Prabhupada defines here in Bhagavatam 1536, he said, while performing duties, so we just mentioned those, what those duties were, right? Getting up early, taking a bath, entering the temple, collecting flowers. While performing duties to the, according to the order of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one constantly remembers him, his names, and his qualities. So that's how one does a Bhyas Yoga, or Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, that as one is doing these activities for Krishna, one makes an effort let me think about Krishna, let me think about Krishna, because one is doing one's activities for Krishna, one can do that. And Prabhupada's purport to 1527, he says, the gross body should be engaged in acts of rendering service to the Lord, as in bringing water, cleansing the temple, or making obeisances, etc. The path of Archana, or worshipping the Lord in the temple, involves engaging one's gross senses in the service of the Lord. Similarly, the subtle mind should be engaged in hearing the transcendental pastimes of the Lord thinking about them, chanting his name, etc. And we see if we go back to this other slide, 
where Prabhupada is talking about externals, taking a bath, chanting Hare Krishna, collecting flowers. And then he also says, and one should constantly hear Bhagavad Gita so, and Bhagavatam. So that's on the platform of the mind. So both things are going on here. In the Abhyas Yoga that Krishna is describing in text 9 of this chapter 12, there's two things going on simultaneously. One is engaging one's gross senses in the rules and regulations, the to do and the not to do of, of bhakti, and one is making an effort to keep bringing one's mind back to Krishna. And we should just note that in text 8, Raganuga Sadhana, one is also engaging one's gross senses. I mean, externally, somebody on the path of text 8 and someone on the path of text 9 are not going to look that different. Someone on the path of text 8 and text 9, they're both engaged externally in bhakti. Someone on text 8 is constantly absorbed in Krishna with their mind and intelligence. Someone on text 9 is, dr- is dragging their mind and intelligence back over and over again. Now this is also interesting here in Prabhupada's purport to this chapter, text 20. And in text 20, in the purport, Prabhupada gives a summary of the whole chapter. Prabhupada talks about the mood of one in a Bhyas Yoga. Not just always thinking about Krishna, but Prabhupada says, one need not bother about materials to keep body and soul together because by the grace of the Lord, everything is carried out automatically. Now, one may ask, well, does this mean that if one's in the household or ashram, that one doesn't do some, something to have a source of income? No, of course not. That's, if you're in the household or ashram, doing something to have a source of income is part of your service. If you're in the brahmachari, vanaprastha, or sannyas ashram, not doing something to get an income is part of your service. If you're engaged in earning an income in the brahmachari, vanaprastha, or sannyas ashrams, uh, then you either need to change your ashram and get married, or you need to get it together to follow your ashram. But in the grahastha ashram, part of one's duty is to earn a livelihood, and as Bhaktivinoda Thakur writes in his Sharanagati prayers, that the devotee is earning a livelihood for the household, but he's thinking this is Krishna's household, and this is just my duty to maintain Krishna's, Krishna's household, very much like the brahmachari, who's going out and collecting donations of, of goods or money, is doing that in order to maintain his guru, in order to maintain the temple. He's not thinking, I mean, he turns everything over to the guru. So in a similar way, the grahasta who is performing Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti is giving everything to the deity. Right? The grahasta should have an altar in, in their home, and the deity is the proprietor. They're not thinking, this money is for me. This money is for my sense and enjoyment. And of course, Prabhupada talks about that the grahasta gives 50% of their income for Krishna and 50% for family maintenance, so certainly the Rahasta has the, um, not just the, the, the right, but the Rahasta actually in one sense has an obligation to use part of their income for the maintenance of their family members, and we could even say for the uh, sensory needs, I wouldn't say sense gratification in a, in a sense of being separate from Krishna, but the basic bodily, mental, emotional, social needs, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur describes so wonderfully that the grahasta has some obligation to provide for these things for the family members and for one's self. In fact, there's a nice description in the 11th canto of this one brahmana who was so stingy that he wouldn't allow any kind of material facility for himself or his family members with his money. So certainly the grahasta needs to do that. That's what the grahasta ashram is for. But one is not in any anxiety if one is doing Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, one's anxiety is how can I bring my mind back to Krishna? One's anxiety is not about bodily maintenance. One is engaged in the activities of maintaining the body and the mind and the emotions and all these things out of at duty for Krishna because that's one's duty according to one's ashram and not thinking that I am the doer. So this is quite important principle of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti and certainly it's there in Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti and whether or not one can maintain this mood is really going to be crucial to whether or not you're going to be engaged in, in abhyas yoga. Why is that? Because abhyas yoga is all about what you're doing with your mind and your intelligence. And if one is thinking, 
it's my duty to maintain the family. How am I going to get money? How am I going to get money? How am I going to get money? I'm the doer. I'm the doer. I'm the doer. You're not going to be able to be absorbed in Krishna. The fact is you're absorbed in Krishna. Then you go about your duty to earn an income according to your propensities. But your anxiety is for Krishna. Your anxiety is not for your income. Now, how does one get from Abhyas Yoga to Raganuga Bhakti? How does one make this jump from text 9 to text 8? So that is described in text 9, where Krishna uses the word icha, desire. In this way, Krishna says, by repetitive practice, develop a desire to attain me or Krishna. So we can't stress how important this is. This is if if anyone who's, who's listening to this, if you can see, okay, this is where I am. I'm in Abhyas Yoga. I'm in Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. My body is engaged in the Angas of Bhakti. I'm making an effort as much as I possibly can to fix my mind and intelligence on Krishna. I do my duty without worrying about maintenance. My worrying is about Krishna. How will I know when I'm ready to progress to Raghunuga Bhakti, how will I know when I'm ready to just fix my mind and intelligence on Krishna? And we get asked this question all the time. How can I become fixed? How, how, what's the jump? What's the jump from, from this struggle? Prabhupada calls it a hard struggle with determination. What's the jump from this struggle? Okay, okay, I've got to think about Krishna. Let me sit down and think about Krishna to just flowing and thinking about Krishna. Well, this bridge, Krishna says, is desire. Because as we explained previously, the fixing of the mind and intelligence on Krishna as described in chapter 8 is a natural samadhi of love and attachment. It's not a mechanical samadhi. And therefore, what we're trying to do by this process of abhyas yoga is increase our desire. Increase our desire. You know, one devotee said to me once, you know, I I don't really know if I have a desire to go back to God. I, I just have a desire to do this and that in the world. <laughs> and that's the problem, isn't it? And I, I said to her, you're really fortunate that you're able to be honest about your desires. Because a lot of times devotees think, oh yeah, I desire to go back to God and I desire to serve Krishna. Well, if you really desire to serve Krishna, you'll be absorbed in him all the time. Because we're absorbed in whatever we desire. So this process of abhyas yoga is meant to awaken, as we read in the other slide, this dormant love. It's already there. It's already there. It simply has to be awakened. There's this wonderful purport in Bhagavatam 1, 2, 3. Easy to remember because it's Bhagavatam 1, 2, 3. <laughs> Where am I going to find the essence of our practice of Krishna consciousness? It's 1, 2, 3 purport in Srimad Bhagavatam. 1, 2, 3 purport. The essence is desire. Prabhupada has this amazing quote. He says, the materialistic world is called the darkest region of God's creation, yet the unhappy materialist can get out of it simply by desiring to get out. Simply by desiring. That's the whole key. If you only remember one thing from today's class, please remember it's all about desire. It's all about desire. So the whole purpose of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, of Urbhyas Yoga, is kindling this desire. Because somebody could say, well, I have the desire to get out. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> good to be honest about our desires. Because we get what we desire. Nichyo, nichyo, nam, chetan, nis, chetan, nam, eko, bahanam, yo, vidadati, kaman. Krishna is all about desire. Whatever we desire, that's going to get. And whatever we've gotten is because that's what we desire. What I have right now, I have it because I have in the past desired it. And to some extent, right now, I'm desiring it. Krishna fulfills desires. What we get is because that's what we desire. And the whole process of bhakti is to increase and increase and increase that desire. So here we see a little chart. Abhyas yoga creates a desire which leads to Raganuga bhakti. Uh, or, we, we just a little note here, that it doesn't have to lead to Raganuga bhakti. It could lead to vaidhi with bhava. So if somebody wants to go to Vaikuntha or Ayodhya instead of Goloka Vrindavan, then a Bhyas Yoga instead of leading to Raganuga will lead to a Vaidhi Bhakti or a reverential Bhakti that's full of Bhava. Well, that's just a, another note. So this is the essence of what we're talking about here. A Bhyas Yoga is you're engaged in the externals of Bhakti with an endeavor to fix your mind on, on Krishna without anxiety for maintenance 
with the aim of increasing desire. That desire then gives you to a point where you're practicing Raghunugana Sadhana or Vaidhi with Bhava, where you're fixing your mind and intelligence constantly on Krishna, and that brings you to the goal, that is a process again, that is not a goal, that brings you to the goal of loving service to Shai Masundar. Okay, so maybe some of us listening to this say, gosh, I'm not even qualified for that. I can't even keep bringing my mind back over and over again on fixing and fixing on Krishna. So now we're going to text 10. And Valade Vijibhushan, a comment that somebody will say, as the mind is fickle like the wind, I do not have the power to restrain it. So if someone says, I just can't do that. I can't pull my mind back over and over again and fix it on Krishna. What am I going to do? So fortunately, there's another step on the direct path. There's another step on the direct path of bhakti for those who say, I cannot yet even practice fixing my mind on Krishna. And that is the angas of bhakti, but performed without working to fix the mind on bhakti. So here we see the direct path, the angas of bhakti to abhyas yoga or vaidhisattana bhakti, which leads to desire, which leads to raganuga bhakti. So Vishnu Chakravati Thakur comments on text 10, and, and this is so important, and I hope this will give solace and, and comfort to many. He says, doing services, karmadi kurvan, such as hearing and singing about me, Krishna in other words, bowing to me, Krishna, worshipping me, Krishna, sweeping and washing my temple, picking flowers, even without remembrance of me as previously described, you will attain perfection sitting, characterized by being one of my associates in prema. So that's Vishnu Chakravati Thakur's quote. So these are external activities of bhakti. So Vishnu Chakravati Thakur says, okay, can't fix your mind on Krishna, can't practice fixing your mind on Krishna, hear about Krishna, sing about Krishna, bow to Krishna, worship Krishna, wash Krishna's temples, pick flowers, and you will come to the perfect stage of prema. Not directly, of course, but through this path. That by doing that, you will come to Abhyas Yoga. By doing that, you will come to Raghunuga Bhakti. All right, now what mood do you have to have? Folks, this is really important. My dear friends, this is really, really important. Just like for Vaidhi Sadhana, one had to have a mood of anxiety for Krishna and not a mood of anxiety for maintenance. So in order to be on the step of text 10, which is working for Krishna without making an effort to withdraw the mind, one has to have no attraction for the higher planets, such as the moon or the sun or heaven, no attraction for even Brahma Loka, and no attraction for merging in the Brahma Jyoti. One has to be free of a desire for bhukti and mukti. One has to be convinced that the association of Krishna and his supreme abode, Goloka Vrindavan, is the highest perfection of life. So to be on the bottom rung of the direct path, to be on the bottom rung of the direct path, one has to have this faith that being with Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan is the highest perfection of life and nothing else is the highest perfection. One has to at least have this mental conviction. One has to have this mental conviction. Now, how does one make the jump? How does one make the jump from doing the angas of bhakti externally to a bhyas yoga where one is practicing to fix the mind. Now we want to say again that the activities of somebody, the external activities of someone in 8, 9, and, and now we're adding 10, in text 8, 9, and 10, are not going to look that different from another. You're not going to be able to just look at somebody who's on text 8 in Raganuga Sadhana, in text 9, or Vaidhi Sadhana, Abhyas Yoga, and text 10, Krishna Karmadi, working for Krishna and tell who's on what platform. You know? Because they're all going to be doing the Angas of Bhakti. 
they're all going to be collecting flowers for the worship. They're all going to be chanting japa. They're all going to be going to kirtans. They're all going to be hearing the Bhagavatam. Right? The difference is in the internal consciousness primarily. Of course, there will, also, there will be some external symptoms for sure in terms of character and, and behavior and mood. But the difference is internal. The mood of someone in text 8 is, oh, I love Krishna. The mood of someone in text 9 is, I'm just depending on Krishna. My anxiety is for Krishna. I want to attain Krishna. The mood of someone in text 10 is, Krishna is the supreme goal of life. Now, how are you going to get from text 10 to text 9? From the externals of bhakti to abhyas yoga? Well, you've got to attain peace. Right? What is the person in Vaidhi Sadhana doing that the person in Krishna Karmadi is not doing? The person in Vaidhi Sadhana or Abhyas Yoga, they're pulling their mind back and fixing it on Krishna over and over again, their mind and intelligence. And the person in text 10 who's working for Krishna is not doing that. Why aren't they doing that? Because their mind's not peaceful. Their mind's so disturbed. Their mind's running around like the wind. Therefore, just like the bridge from Abhyas Yoga to Raganuga Sadhana is desire, the bridge from Krishna Karmani to Abhyas Yoga is peace. One has to have a peaceful mind. Therefore, Krishna is saying, Shantihi, one will become peaceful. Huh? One will attain peace. And in our part three, which we'll give next week, we will look at the qualifications of peace. That's text 12 to 13. I can't emphasize how important this one, chapter 12, is. Now, if we can understand chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, you don't need to understand anything else. Now, how does the person on the bhakti path achieve peace? How do you do this? So let's say that you, you figured out by now, oh my God, okay, I'm in text 10. I'm in Krishna Karmani. I'm not even in, in, in Vaidhi Sadhana. I'm not even in a Bhyas Yoga because I'm not even trying to think about Krishna. I'm just running around working for Krishna. So how does the person who's running around working for Krishna, how do they get the peace that will enable such a person to come to a Bhyas Yoga? So this is given in Bhagavad Gita 529. Bhaktaram Yagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatvamam Shantim Ritshiti that if you know Krishna, that he's the enjoyer, the benefactor, and your friend, then you get peace. So let's get into this in some depth, because I think this is really important for many, many devotees. How do you do this? Let's get, what is this essence of 529? There was a, a deity of Krishna in the very early days of the movement, just Krishna standing with his hand on his hip. I wish I could get a photo of that deity. Uh, he wasn't installed on the altar. He was placed like in the vestibule of the temple. And Prabhupada said this deity should be named Kartami Shai. Kartami Shai. The boss. <laughs> the way one attains the peace required to practice fixing the mind on Krishna is to have this mood that Krishna is Kartami Shai, the boss. Let's get into this a little bit. This is Bhagavatam 1535. Yad Atra Kriyati Karma Bhagavat Paritoshanam Jnanam Yat Tad Ahinam Hi Bhakti Yoga Saman Bitam. Whatever work is done here in this life is for the, satisfa for the satisfaction of the mission of the Lord is called Bhakti Yoga or Transcendental Loving Service to the Lord. Whatever I'm doing, I say, this is for Krishna. My dear friends, what we're talking about now is the essence of the mood of text 10 of chapter 12. I'm working for Krishna. I'm not working. I'm working for Krishna. I love this letter. It's to my god sister Sacharya, 1972. He says, you are married wife, so in that position you should serve your husband nicely always, being attentive to his needs. The nature of woman is to be attached to her husband and family. So our system is to minimize this attachment by making the ultimate goal of our activity the pleasure of Krishna. Just try to please Krishna always, 
and no material circumstances will be able to cause you any discomfort. How interesting. How interesting. Here Prabhupada's talking about a wife. And he's saying generally the woman is very attached to husband and family. What does that attachment mean? That attachment means that I'm serving my husband with the view of pleasing my husband. Why do I want to please my husband? And here's Prabhupada saying, be attentive to his needs because I want to get something from him. That's what attachment means. Attachment means I'm thinking, let me please my husband and be attentive to his needs and that way I'll be taken care of. Aha. So Prabhupada says, decrease your attachment to your husband. Oh, what does that mean? I, I won't care about pleasing him anymore? Oh, oh. When is still going to be attentive to his needs, but for whose pleasure? For the pleasure of Krishna. Simple switch. Simple switch. For the pleasure of Krishna. So, you know, my husband really likes rice style japatis and sabji. That's what I'm going to cook, but not so my husband will be pleased. So Krishna will be pleased. I'm being very attentive to his needs, but so Krishna will be pleased. Why am I going to work hard at my job? Why am I going to study hard in school? Why am I going to be kind to my wife? Why am I going to take care of my children? So Krishna will be pleased. My mood is Krishna's watching. Okay? It's like some places you go, they have these security cameras, right? Somebody's watching. We make some phone calls and there's a little announcement. This call is being recorded. So Krishna's watching, right? Everything we do, it's being recorded. Krishna's in our heart. Ishwar Sarvabhutanam Radesh Arjuna Chistati. Brahman Sarvabhutani Yantra Rudrani Maya. Krishna's there. He's watching. He's listening. Is he pleased? Have you ever done something with somebody knowing that someone else is watching and really trying to please the person who's watching, not the person you're interacting with? You ever done that? Sure, we all have. We've all interacted with person A trying to impress person B. Hmm? Just like if a, if a man wants to marry a woman who already has a child from a previous relationship. So he's playing with that child to impress the woman, not to please the child. Yes? Huh? Love me, love my dog. So the devotee is acting in the world apparently like a materialist being very attentive to the needs of the husband. But why? To please Krishna. This is the mood, this is the essence of Krishna Karmani. This is the essence. Prabhupada says in Bhagavatam 1536 purport, in every sphere of life the Lord should be situated as the proprietor, even in our ordinary dealings. For example, in our household affairs or in our business or, perfection, or perfect, profession. Sorry. Kartami Shai. Krishna's the boss. He's the boss. I work for Krishna. I work for Krishna's company. I give this example a lot. Krishna is the proprietor. I don't really work for my husband or my wife or my mother or my father or for the bank or for the government or for my professor. I work for Krishna. I work for Krishna's company. And what does Krishna's company sell? Love of God. So I'm just trying to sell love of God. I'm trying to taste it myself and sell it to others. And then everyone I interact with is either a co-worker in the company for love of God, a supplier of love of God, or a customer or potential customer of love of God. So when I'm trying to please the customer, I'm really trying to please my boss. When I'm trying to please my co-workers, I'm really trying to please my boss. When I'm trying to please the suppliers, I'm really trying to please my boss. Krishna is the proprietor. That everything one does, everything one says, right? Everything I'm doing, let Krishna be pleased. And in the purport to 1155, which Srila Prabhupada refers to, in the purport to 1210, which is the verse we're talking about now, he says, one should not be attached to the result in his work, but the result should be offered to Krishna, and one should accept as prasadam the remnants of offerings to Krishna. This is the mood of Krishna Karmadi. 
so if one wants to progress to being able to withdraw his mind and thinking in un- of thinking of Krishna, one must adopt this mood. Otherwise, one's not in the path of, of bhakti at all. So one has to ad- adopt this mood. Everything I'm doing, I'm doing for Krishna. And whatever I enjoy is prasadam. My dear friends, Krishna is going to give you things to enjoy in this world. And that's okay. Krishna is going to give you nice food to eat if you're in the Grahasta ashram. He's going to give you gross and subtle sex life and nice clothes and a nice place to stay. Even in the renounced ashram, Krishna is going to give you some pleasures in this world. He's going to give you the pleasure of freedom and detachment, which is, by the way, a much higher freedom and much higher pleasure than other things. Krishna may give you pleasure of intellectual stimulation, good friends, or a beautiful view from the top of a mountain. Krishna is going to give us so many pleasures even in this world, but we accept them as our prasadam. Just like when you work for a company. When you work for a company, the boss is going to give you a salary, and the boss is going to give you vacations. Maybe there will be a birthday party in the office for you. You know, the boss is not just going to give you what you need for your work, but the boss is also going to take care of you. So everything is done for the pleasure of the boss, and whatever we get as enjoyment is our prasadam. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati also explains this in his purport to Brahma Samhita, text 61. So this is the mood of Krishna Karmadi. All right, summary of our direct path. First step, engaging the senses in the activities of bhakti externally without an endeavor to fix the mind on Krishna with the mood that Krishna is the boss. From that step, next step, practice of pulling the mind back repeatedly to Krishna while engaging the senses in bhakti. So internal and external. Last step, full absorption of mind and intellect in Krishna leading to smarana atmika, very internal. Of course, one is still doing the external bhakti, uh, angas of bhakti. And here we see another chart that the angas of bhakti, which give us peace, bring us to abhyas yoga, which gives us desire, which brings us to raganuga bhakti. Oh, there's another box in this chart. And that shows us there's another way of getting to this abhyas yoga. There's another way of getting to this abhyas yoga. And this is now going to be detailed by Krishna in text 11 and 12, summarized by Srila Prabhupada in the purport to text 20. Let's look at this indirect path. Now, please keep in mind, this is an indirect path, not to the Angas of, not to Krishna Karmani, not to working for Krishna, and not to Raganuga Bhakti. This is an indirect path to Abhyas Yoga. So this is the path that will take you to text 9 of chapter 12. All right, it starts with Varnashram. It starts with the person who's engaged in pious work for heaven on earth or after death. Now that's not part of the path, but that's your preliminary qualification. Then the path itself starts, the starting the path, because Varnashram is material, totally. It's not a yoga. So the yoga path starts from the base of Varnashram, this yoga ladder. You can think of Varnashram is the floor or the ground upon which the ladder is resting. The ladder itself, first step, working for purification, not heaven. Second step, knowledge of the self and Brahman. Third step, meditation on the self and Brahman. Achieving realization of self, Brahman, and Paramatma. And then moving from that to Abhyas Yoga. So an overview. Srila Prabhupada gives an overview of this indirect path. Step one, live according to the dictates of one's social and spiritual order and acquire sufficient piety to qualify to... Two, which is really step one of the path. Practice karma yoga. Three, progress to jnana yoga. Four, finally in meditation or jnana yoga, realize the transcendental and supreme position of the Lord. Five, see in the heart the eternal transcendental two-handed form of the Supreme Lord, known as Shana Sundar, playing his flute. So, preliminary qualification. Live according to the dictates of one's social and spiritual order to acquire sufficient piety. Prabhupada details this in the book Renunciation Through Wisdom. This is called Varnashram Dharma. This is just the floor of the ground, folks. This is not yoga. Varnashram 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 has to do with the body and mind wholly and solely. Varnashram Dharma is simply, I'm 
living according to these dictates. Why? What's my purpose? I want a nice life. I want to be happy. I want to be happy in this life, and I want to go to heaven in the next life. That's the mood of Varnashram, and the mood of Varnashram is also on the doer. On the doer. Gartaham iti manyate. I'm the doer, and I'm doing pious activity to go to heaven. But without that, you cannot do the yoga letter. Notice that this was not a qualification for the direct path. You remember we talked about that when looking at text 1 through 7. Varnashram is not necessary as a qualification for taking up the direct path. If it was, most of us in Kali would be in trouble because we don't really have a perfect Varnashram. Okay, but for the indirect path, you've got to first have Varnashram. Okay, step one on the yoga ladder. You put your yoga ladder on the firm floor of Varnashram. And you're going to see here why Varnashram is a qualification. Step one is karma yoga. Detach Varnashram duties. Well, how are you going to do detached Varnashram duties if you're not already doing Varnashram duties? Does that make sense to everybody? I can't do Varnashram duties detached unless I'm already doing Varnashram duties. Therefore, Varnashram is a qualification. In Bhakti, was there any talk about doing detached from ashram duties? No. In the direct path, what is there talk of? Gathering flowers for Krishna, singing about Krishna, and so forth. Right? So what does one detach? What do we mean detach? We mean detach from the fruit. Sarva, karma, palatyagam in verse 11 and karma, palatyagas in verse 12. Give up the fruit. Karma means work. Pala means fruit. Tyaga means give up. Sarva kar- karma palatiyag. What is the fruit? The fruit is heaven. The fruit is material enjoyment. Why is a person pious? So they can enjoy in this life and in the next. Step one on the yoga ladder. I'm still being pious. I'm still doing my pious work. But I'm doing it to be purified. I'm doing it to be purified. Now you can see, going back to text 1 through 7, why this is so much harder than even Krishna Karmani. Krishna Karmani... I'm working for Krishna, the person, as the boss. But here in Karma Yoga, I'm just working for the Brahman. I'm just working for liberation. It's it's really vague. You know, Prabhupada talks about, in Ramananda Samvada, he talks about that one is seeing one's work as part of the universal form. One's really kind of offering one's work to the universal form. So it's much harder. Detach from ashram duties. So I'm still serving my husband, but instead of serving my husband so Krishna will smile, and instead of serving my husband so I'll have a happy married life, I'm serving my husband so I'll be liberated and I'll merge into the Brahman. Wow, that's harder, isn't it? So the materialist, I'm serving my husband so he'll smile at me and he'll love me and he'll give me jewelry and nice food and children and a beautiful house and tell me how beautiful I am, right? On Krishna Karmani or a Bhyas Yoga, I'm serving my husband, or even Raganuga Sadhana, I'm serving my husband so Krishna will smile at me. But here in Karma Yoga, I'm serving my husband so I'll get liberated. Hmm. But that's Karma Yoga. Right? Here's step one. And Krishna describes it as Mad Yogam Ashritaha. Taking refuge in my method which gives protection, taking shelter of the process of offering all your actions to me. But we should note that this me, as we explained in text 1 through 7, is not Shamasundar. Right? If you're offering to me, Shamasundar, then you're in text 10. You're in Krishna Karmani. But if the me that you're offering to is Paramatma or Brahman, or even if you're thinking about yourself, remember in text 1 we were debating whether Arjuna is talking about meditation on the self or meditation on Brahman, if you're offering to yourself, I want to realize myself. Hmm? And interesting, look at this. Yatatmavan, with a controlled mind. So in order to do karma yoga, you have to have a controlled mind. Pretty high qualification. Hmm? How, do you get that, how do you get that qualification? By performing Varnashram properly, which gives you the piety to come to the mode of goodness to be able to control your mind. All right, then step two. Step two, you become purified now through karma yoga. You've controlled your mind. You're pious, and you're offering all your piety to Brahman. Well, now you study the Upanishads, Prabhupada's explaining in the purport to Srimad Bhagavatam 10.845. 
referencing, Prabhupada in this purport, is referencing Bhagavad Gita 10.12. He says, study the Upanishads and gain Brahma Gyan, impersonal realization of the absolute truth. And then he advances still further to Sankhya Yoga in order to understand the Supreme Controller who is indicated in Bhagavad Gita 10.12. Panam Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram, oh, 10.12, I'm sorry, not 12.10, my mistake. 10.12 Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavam Purusham Sasvatam. So this is the process of Gyan Yoga. The process of Gyan Yoga is, now you're not so much engaged in the activities of the world. Please try to understand this distinction. In Karma Yoga, you're out doing your Varna and Ashram. Okay? You're out uh, acting according to your Varna and Ashram working in the world. Well, in Gyan Yoga, you know, you're not doing that anymore. In Gyan Yoga, you're just studying the scriptures. That's your work. It's very interesting that in the Jewish tradition, there's definitely a place for this Gyan Yoga. So in the Jewish tradition, it's where, basically, by the way, everybody gets married. There's no renounced ashram among the Jewish tradition, at least not in modern history. So they encourage a married man to cease from all regular work and simply study the scriptures. Not even teach, just study. And the traditional Jewish communities would have a fund that everyone in the village would contribute to that would maintain a married man who would spend all of his time just studying. This has become a very controversial thing now in Israel because the Jews who do this are very religious Jews. As such, they don't use birth control. They have large families. And rather than the village contributing, they end up being wards of the state while they're simply studying the Torah and they, they don't engage in military service and so many things. So there's been a big protest from the other people in the community. You know, what, what good are these people doing for the world? They're having large families, which we then have to maintain, and all they're doing is studying, and they don't do any good for anybody. Now, in Vedic society, though, there was a class of persons, many of them grahastas. Uh, in fact, Manu Mars was telling me that some of the greatest jnanis are also grahastas, and their method was study of the scripture. Now, by study of the scripture, they become detached. And by this detachment, they're fixing their mind on Brahman. Uh, we should have a little note here that in Bhagavad Gita 5.4, Krishna says that the purpose of Sankhya and the purpose of Karma Yoga is the same. Therefore, it is possible for a person to skip step one on the yoga ladder and go directly from Varnashram to Gyan Yoga. One does not have to go through Karma Yoga to go to Gyan Yoga. We might say similarly, a person doesn't have to perform Krishna Karmani before performing Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. A person could perform Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti directly from the life that they're in. All right, now we're going to go to step three on the yoga path, Jnan Yoga or meditation. So how does either Karma Yoga or Jnana Yoga, which is generally one goes from Karma Yoga to Gyan Yoga to Dhyan Yoga, but one could also go directly from Gyan Yoga to Dhyan Yoga. So how, what's the bridge from Karma Yoga or Gyan Yoga to Dhyan Yoga? So in Bhagavatam 11.23.45, which Prabhupada quotes in his purport to Bhagavatam 2.3.147, um, Srila Prabhupada says, charity, prescribed duties, observing major and minor regulative principles, hearing from scripture, performing pious works, and observing purifying vows, all finally aim at subduing the mind. Indeed, concentration of the mind on the supreme is the highest yoga. So, the purpose of karma yoga or, and or jnana yoga is to subdue the mind to enable you to practice jnana yoga. So, here is the bridge, and Krishna explains this bridge in... 12.12 Chagach Chantir Anantaram Chagach is renunciation Chantir is Shantir or peace Anantaram At the end you gain peace If you do detached work with the goal of purification rather than heaven or if you're engaged in studying the philosophy of the scriptures what will you attain? You'll attain peace and those of you who remember are those engaged in Krishna Karmani with Krishna as the as the boss, uh, they attain the peace that allows them to attain a Vyasa Yoga. Oh, you're seeing the connection here. Yes. The result of Karma Yoga. Krishna says, 
peace thereafter. Right? Shantim Anantaram. At the end, one will attain peace. Tajak Chantir Anantaram. The result of letting go of our attachments is peace. Quite literally, what comes at the end of your renunciation is peace. So this is freedom. Freedom is the result of detachment. So if you work for purification instead of heaven, you will gain peace, which allows you to sit down and study the scriptures all day. <laughs> How are you going to sit down and study the scriptures all day without running around making money, this or that? You have to be peaceful. That's why generally one is engaged in karma yoga before gyan yoga. And by studying the scriptures, your peace intensifies. So whether you do that immediately and directly or after karma yoga, by studying the scriptures, you become detached. You realize, oh, well, I am not this body. I have nothing to do with this world. This world is simply full of suffering. And then you gain peace. And Krishna describes this in Bhagavad Gita 270. A person who's not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled but is always still, can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. What's he talking about? He's talking about karma yoga. Right? He's talking about karma yoga. You're not trying to satisfy your desires. You're working, or gyan yoga, you're working, but you're working for purification. And in Gyan Yoga, you're not really even working. You're just studying. You're studying philosophy. You're studying the scriptures in order to attain peace. Ashantasya Kutam Sukam, Bhagavad Gita 266. How can there be any happiness without peace? So the intelligent person understands, and this is something we preach a lot in the Hare Krishna movement, intelligent person understands, I don't gain happiness by sense gratification. I gain happiness by peace. The happiness achieved by detachment and peace is so much greater than the happiness achieved by sense gratification. Then we come to step three on the yoga ladder, uh, which is in the purport of Srimad Bhagavatam 10.8.45. Prabhupada says, When one understands that Purusha, the supreme controller, to be Paramatma, one is engaged in the method of yoga, jnana vasista tad gatena manasa pasyantiyam yogina, Jhana. Now that one has attained peace, one has understood, one has realized, one has gained some realization of Brahman through Karma Yoga and Gyan Yoga, or maybe just Gyan Yoga, or maybe just Karma Yoga, and one has now realized, I'm a soul. I'm part of Brahman. I'm part of Paramatma. One has peace. And now one starts meditating on the Lord. All right, so that, that is the process. This process. The third step on the yoga ladder is jhana, where one is engaged in meditation. And we, we all have some idea of what this is. It was described in Chapter 6. You're sitting in a solitary place. You're controlling the life errors. You're doing the asanas of yoga. Now, who's going to do this? Who's going to do this jhana yoga? Well, some householders, we have in the Bhagavatam, Kardama Muni and Aditi, where Kardama Muni goes away from home for long periods of time to engage in meditation. Right? And then he comes back and, and sees how his wife is doing and so forth. Uh, we would expect that this is engaged in primarily by renunciates because Jnana Yoga usually requires absolute brahmacharya. But there certainly are some grahastas who would also engage in Jnana Yoga. But we would assume that in most cases, having achieved Brahman realization through Karma Yoga or Jnana Yoga, one then leaves the world entirely. So in karma yoga, one is still working in the world externally, though one's goal and consciousness is different. In jnana yoga, one's not really working in the world. One's just studying. And certainly one's consciousness is different. In jnana yoga, one, for all intents and purposes, leaves the world, uh, it, even though one might still be in the grahasta ashram. Uh, generally, one would go to the vanaprastha or sannyas ashram. All right, how does one get from karma yoga... Uh, Dhyan Yoga or Gyan Yoga or Dhyan Yoga to a Vyas Yoga because if you remember way back when that this is the indirect path to a Vyas Yoga. Prabhupada says in his purport to Bhagavad Gita 12.5 it's by the grace of a devotee. Because when you get to Dhyan Yoga now you've realized the Supreme. You're meditating on the Supreme. But you have to have some faith that the Supreme is Krishna. This has to have some grace. So all these people, if they're coming directly from karma yoga to a yoga or directly from jnana yoga to a yoga, 
or, or in the typical scenario, they go from karma yoga, yan yoga, to jan yoga, to abhyas yoga. They're going to make this switch because they have this peace. They already have the peace. And they've gotten the grace of a devotee. So now we're going to look at the chart, which brings everything all together. We're coming to the end of our presentation. Sorry, it's a little over an hour. Uh, so let's look at this whole ladder. At the bottom is ugra karma, or v karma, sinful activities. Right? So a person might, they start with doing sinful activities, activities against the Shastra, which will take him to the lower planets or the lower species. From there, one can go directly to the Angas of Bhakti, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 436, even if you're the most sinful of all sinners. So one can go directly to the Angas of Bhakti. Uh, one could also go directly to Abhyas Yoga, but not usually. Uh, then the next step up the yoga ladder is to Karma Kanda, or what we call Varnashram where one is living a pious life. The, goal, the, the result of that is to take a pious birth on earth or to go to Swargaloka. One can go directly from a pious life or Varnashram to the Angas of Bhakti, which is described in Bhagavad Gita 728, that if one's pious in this life and in previous lives, one can take up Bhakti. Going up the yoga ladder from Karma Kanda, you can go to Karma Yoga, also called Akarma. Uh, you've attained the piety which enables you to practice karma yoga. Now, if you die just having performed karma yoga, you will take birth in a yogi family or in swarga or the planets of the Prajapatis or the planets of the rishis. Uh, from karma yoga, you can go directly to abhyas yoga. So, if you're expert in karma yoga, you do not need to first just take up the external angas of bhakti because you will have developed both peace, you have developed the peace that enables you to practice abhyas yoga. If you just immediately take up the angas of bhakti, that also gives you the peace to practice abhyas yoga. To move from karma yoga to abhyas yoga, you also need faith from the association of a devotee. Then to move from karma yoga to gyan yoga, you have the peace which enables you to perform gyan yoga. If you die in gyan yoga, you attain brahman. The gyan yogi can again practice abhyas yoga with faith. From Gyan Yoga, you can go to Gyan Yoga. Again, you can go there directly from Karma Yoga. You don't have to go through Gyan Yoga. To Gyan Yoga or meditation, which will achieve Brahman or Paramatma. From Gyan Yoga, you can go to Abhyas Yoga. Please note that from Gyan Yoga, you cannot go immediately to Raganuga Bhakti. From Gyan Yoga, you can go to Abhyas Yoga with faith. And here we're going to look, we're going to add in Vainashram. Who performs these different things on the yoga ladder? You will see that Ugra Karma is perverted Varnashram or below Varnashram. Karma Kanda is engaged in by Grahastas of all the Varnas for the purpose of enjoyment. Karma Yoga is engaged in by Grahastas of all Varnas for purification. Gyan Yoga is engaged in almost exclusively by Brahmanas. The other Varnas will not be able to engage in it and often they will be renunciates, so they don't have to be. Jnana yoga can only be engaged in again by brahmanas, and usually these are renunciates. We see that va uh, the angas of bhakti, as well as abhyas yoga, can include optional varnashram as a subsidiary spiritual function, which bhakti siddhartha calls go uh, gona dharma. So the angas of bhakti, they're not dependent on varnashram, but they can include Varnashram as can Abhyas Yoga. Even Raganuga Bhakti can include Varnashram, but only to set an example for others or for some specific service. And you see again this bridge, the Angas of Bhakti to Abhyas Yoga, the bridge is peace, and from Abhyas Yoga to Raganuga, it is desire. So here we see everything put together again in another chart. We see that one gains peace either through the yoga ladder indirectly or the angas of bhakti, which is directly. Uh, from the yoga ladder, you also need faith in the association of a devotee, which will bring one to a bhyas yoga, which then develops desire, which brings one to raganuga bhakti. A little side note is there can also be mixtures. As Prabhupada explains in the purport to 10, 10, 20 to, to 22, he says, by karma misra bhakti, one is elevated to the celestial kingdom. By Gyan Mishra Bhakti, one is able to merge in the Brahman effulgence. And by Yoga Mishra Bhakti, one is able to realize the omnipotency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
The pure bhakti does not depend on karma jnana or yoga, for it simply consists of loving affairs. So it is possible to be in the yoga ladder mixed with bhakti. You can have karma misra bhakti, jnana misra bhakti, or yoga misra bhakti. And you see that they have very much the same results as karma yoga, jnana yoga, and jnana yoga. So purity bhakti does not depend on karma jnana or yoga. It, it doesn't depend, doesn't need any of those. Okay, a little overview summary. The indirect path is the long road, as Prabhupada says in his purport to 647. From the beginning of karma yoga to the end of bhakti yoga is a long way to self-realization. Karma yoga without fruit of results is the beginning of this path. When karma yoga increases in knowledge and renunciation, the stage is called gyan yoga. When gyan yoga increases in meditation on the super soul by different physical processes and the mind is on him, it is called astanga yoga. And when one surpasses the Asanga Yoga and comes to the point of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, it is called Bhakti Yoga, the culmination. So that is a long road. And as we said in our discussion of texts 1 through 7, it's a road where it's, it's difficult and unnatural. Then in Path of Perfection, Chapter 8, Prabhupada says, Why walk up all these steps if we have a chance to take an elevator? By means of an elevator, we can reach the top in a matter of seconds. Bhakti Yoga is the elevator of the direct process by which we can reach the top in a matter of seconds. We can go step by step following all the other yoga systems or we can go directly. And here's our elevator. So this concludes our presentation. I think we'll go to this slide where you can see the overview. And uh, I am sorry we went a little late. We kind of went into the questioning time. Uh, but we could probably take uh, a few questions. And again, I'm sorry we went a little late and perhaps some of you left us because of the time. We can take some questions. Sorry. Um, Karun, I'm just about to uh, unmute everybody. A reminder is once I unmute, you need to make sure you're muted unless you have something that you'd like to say. Please, if you have any questions or comments unmute your, or yourself. So I'm going to universally unmute everybody right now. Mother Irma, is there any realistic value in the yoga ladder at this time in, in the age of Kali Yuga? We know that Lord Chaitanya has sung a beautiful song which we all learned early on. Harinam, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalu and Nasteva, 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 Gatya, when you talk. It seems like the direct, it seems like the direct route and taking immediately to Abhyas Yoga is, is really the only option. Yes, uh, that's true. That at the present time, to try to say to everybody, okay, do Varnashram, then take the Karma Yoga, who's going to be able to do it? How are you going to do proper Varnashram at the present time? Now, having said that, Keep in mind that there are people on the planet today who are attached to different steps of the yoga left. They're there. Now, there are people on the planet who are attached to being pious or to detached work. As I was saying uh, in the Jewish community today, there are people who are attempting to practice Gyan Yoga. Definitely. Without any doubt ab about it at all. I'm sure the same is true in India. I'm sure the same is true in the, in the Christian tradition. So you have people in the Christian tradition who are practic definitely who are pra trying to practice at least karma yoga, who are trying to practice gyan yoga. There are, uh, especially in the monastic Catholic, I'm sure also in the Eastern Orthodox, I'm sure also in the Muslim tradition, there are people who are trying to practice gyan yoga. And for sure there are people trying to practice Dhyan Yoga. So there are people who are attracted to and attached to these different steps on the yoga ladder. And what we probably want to do is first get them to mix bhakti into their practice to end up instead of with karma yoga, uh, we want them to end up with karma misha bhakti yoga. And then move over directly to bhakti. But as far as our, is one going to really make progress through the yoga ladder at the present time? Boy, it's risky. It's risky. Because a lot of people thinking they're in these practices, they're not really following them. You know, if we think of all these people trying to do karma yoga and gyan yoga and eating meat. 
and people trying to do jnana yoga and having illicit sex and taking drugs. I mean, they, so they're they're really on the, you know, they're back on the v karma platform. They're on the the sinful life platform, trying to practice these higher levels of yoga that depend on piety. You know, it just doesn't work very well. Uh, but there are people attached to those things. I, I believe that understanding this part of the Bhagavad Gita is most essential for two reasons. Those of us who want to claim that we're on the direct path to make sure we actually are. Because I have seen so much Karma Mishra Bhakti, Gyan Mishra Bhakti, and even some Jan Mishra Bhakti, Yoga Mishra Bhakti among the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And I've seen many people preach it. I've seen many, many people preach, if you're not following Varnashram and you're not pious, you can't do bhakti. Or they'll preach your main method of purification is Varnashram. And I've heard people preach, you know, first you have to realize the self and become detached and then you can think of Krishna. So people are, we don't preach so much yoga, misra bhakti, but I've heard a lot of preaching of gyan, misra bhakti and karma, misra bhakti, even in the, in, in ISKCON. Quite a lot. So I, I see that there's a, a real lack of understanding of what path we're on among the devotees. The other reason for really understanding this, and by the way, as I mentioned the other day, you're on the wrong path. It's going to be slow and miserable. And if, if one's experience of bhakti is that it's really slow, it's really draggy, and it's not really blissful, you're probably mixing yoga ladder stuff in with your bhakti. And there may be other reasons, such as offenses against devotees, you know, I do know some people who eat Vaishnava Parad for breakfast, but generally the problem is we're mixing. The other reason to understand this stuff is again as, as teachers and preachers that we are going to run into people who are very, very, very attached to being on this yoga ladder. They're really attached to it. And we need to know, A, what's the benefit of the yoga ladder? It, it's, not, it's not rubbish. You know, what is the benefit? What is it doing for them? If we find somebody who is actually advanced in karma yoga or gyan yoga or gyan, what you could gyan yoga, they can boom right go over to Vaidhi Sadhana. They don't have to be external. I mean, I have there's one devotee I know who might even be listening to this class, one of my uh, Shiksha disciples, that before joining the, the Hare Krishna movement, he was a Buddhist monk for I think 20 years, and was engaged in gyan. So if somebody's been doing Jan for 20 years, they're able to, to take up practices of bhakti that somebody coming right from, you know, marijuana smoking, hamburger eating, movie going, is not going to be able to do very easily. So to be able to know as a preacher and teacher, if we meet people who are genuinely on this ladder, how to engage them, and also to know how to preach to people that they can make this jump over to bhakti. Mataji, I have about yeah. half a dozen questions. Maybe I can get in one. Uh, they're all your questions or they're other people's questions? No, oh, mine. <laughs> uh, Great answer. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, Raman, why don't you pick the, your most important question because it's already late. I think I'll have time for one. Okay. Uh, most important question for me is I, the jump from uh, the Angas, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, the, the yoga ladder to Abhyasa yoga. We've had this discussion, especially with Mary Overdon and others. Uh, why? Uh, how is it possible that they come in contact with the devotee? Is there any qualification for those that are on the yoga ladder that they're going to make that jump? You know, like, uh, what about the unfortunate people that don't? make the jump because they don't come in contact with the devotees. And they're going to be stuck. Yeah, I mean, are they stuck or is they... they know where are they going to go? So, that, so, well, you know, if you enter into the, like, if you attain, say you attain the Brahman or you attain Paramatma, from the Brahman, you don't really have much option but to come back to the material world and then find devotee. But, you know, you come back without any karma. So you come back, you come to the higher planets where you can get some nice association with devotees. With the Paramatma, you should be able to go from Paramatma to Bhagavan without having to come back and take another birth. 
it's possible that you'll meet some devotees of, of Bhagavan there. And the, uh, you know, yeah, I'm wondering in the Brahmin, I mean, I don't know. This is, this is a real wondering point, and I don't know who would know. But I'm just thinking about Brihad Bhagavatamrita, where Lord Shiva is traveling through the Brahmin. And, of course, Lord Shiva also brings persons to Vishnu. I wonder if any living entities can, by association with Lord Shiva, from the Brahman. I don't know. Generally, we talk about that from the Brahman, one has to come back to the material world and from there associate with the devotee. So this would incline us that if somebody's become expert in these yogas in this life, it's to their advantage to get a devotee association in this life before they leave their body. Because once they leave their body and they merge in the Brahman, then they're going to be there for quite a while before they can come back and get some devotee association. So we're trying to give devotee association to everybody on the planet. That's our, our mood. You know, practically speaking, how many people are walking around right now in 2013 that are Brahman realized or Paramatma realized? You know, really, how many people are we talking about here? Not a whole lot. There are some. There definitely are some unquestionably there are some people walking around on the planet right now that are Brahmin realized I've met some of them but uh, it's rare because people aren't usually following this yoga ladder properly so that's that's going to be an, an unusual situation but you know our whole Sankirtan movement is to give people the grace of a devotee is it not? that's our that's part of our own process of, of following the Angas of Bhakti is, is being teachers and preachers no matter who you are, no matter what your external situation is. Is that right? Anyone else have a question? No one else is going to jump in. I do. Well, Mother is there Irma anyone Irma. else, because it is late, is there anyone else who hasn't asked a question who has a question? Hare Krishna, Mother Amala, thank you for such a good class. Uh, Zandabad, my question is very short, I think. Um, you said earlier that the lines of Varn Ashram Dharma are blurred in Kali Yuga, so I'm wondering if it can be on more than one place on the ladder because the lines are blurred because of Kali Yuga. All right, well, that's sort of, we're sort of mixing two things. So one is Varnashram. When we say that, that Varnashram is, is hard to do right now, Varnashram is, is not the yoga ladder proper. Varnashram is the qualification for taking up the yoga ladder. It's not the qualification for taking up bhakti, but it's the qualification for taking up the yoga ladder. And the problem is that right now, it's very difficult to perform Varnashram properly. So we still have people who have Brahminical inclinations, Kshatri inclinations, Vaishya, Shudra, but to really be a proper Brahmana or a proper Vaishya or a proper Shudra right now is pretty hard. Even to be a proper Brahmachari, proper Grahastra, proper Vanaprastra, proper Sannyasi is, is really pretty difficult. I'm sure, absolutely, totally sure, that there are some people on this planet of whatever it is, six, seven billion who are properly situated according to Varna and Ashram. I'm sure there are. I don't know how many, but for sure. But it's, it's unusual. We're not in a situation where the majority of the population is like that, as was true in former ages. In former ages, if somebody was married, they were a proper married couple. The husband and wife were respectful to each other. They were earning an honest living according to their, their Varna. They were raising first-class children. They were contributing some honest means of prosperity to the society and so forth. How many people are doing that today? I mean, people can't even stay married. I mean, it's, well, what do we say? All right, Krishna. So the fact that Varnashram doesn't, the pious life isn't really current on the earth today means that most people are not qualified to take up the yoga ladder. End of story. Now that means if people are trying to go through the yoga ladder, they're probably doing it wrong. So people who are trying to be karma yogis, like I gave the example of the, of the people in Israel who are trying to do gyan yoga. That's what they're trying to do. I'm sure that's not what they call it. 
but that's what they're trying to do. But they're meat eaters. So they don't even have the Varnashram thing right, because to do Gyan Yoga, you've got to be a Brahmani, you're not supposed to eat any meat. So what, are they really doing Gyan Yoga? Oh, not really. So are they really going to get the result of Gyan Yoga? Oh, not really. So in that sense, it's mixed up. If you want to talk about another kind of mixed up, and I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but if you want to talk about a mixed up in terms of can these stages be mixed, the answer is yes, and there's nothing wrong with that. In other words, there's, I was talking about bridges from one to the other. So if you're going from karma khanda to karma yoga, or karma yoga to gyan yoga, or gyan yoga to jnan yoga, or if you're going from the angas bhakti to abhyas yoga, or abhyas yoga to raganuga bhakti, or you're going from the yoga ladder to abhyas yoga, or you're going from ordinary material life and fuller pious to the angas of bhakti, there's bridges. So you can be on one shore and you can also be walking over the bridge. If you're walking over the bridge, you're going to display parts of both things. So if someone's moving from a Bhyas Yoga to Raganuga Bhakti, for example, then they're going to be somewhat pra- practicing Raganuga Bhakti. If they're moving from the Angas of Bhakti to Bhyas Yoga, they're going to be somewhat practicing a Bhyas Yoga. So that's also entirely possible. And in fact, it's expected. Just like on the bodily platform, one goes from being a child, having a child's body to having an adult's body, and there's a bridge. There's a time, like I've got a, a granddaughter here who's, you know, she's starting to get a woman's body, but she's still a child. So, but she's not still a child, but she is still a child. She's on the bridge. She hasn't fully made the transition to adult physici- physicality, and nor is she fully in child physicality. So or we have this, you know, one of my grandsons is going to be flying to India in about six weeks. So he's on the plane. You know, when he's on the plane, where is he? He's flying over the Pacific Ocean. But he's not in the Pacific Ocean. You know, he's kind of, he's en, en route. So one can also be en route. And if one is en route, then there's going to be some mixture. I'm not sure if that was your question. Okay, it, I, it's, it's already 8 o'clock, so I think we should end now. Thank you very much. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. Thank you. you. Wonderful class. Thank we will you meet all. Again. We'll meet again next week, Krishna willing, for the rest of the chapter.